Welcome to English Spoken Perfectly, a channel where we will read good books together and I will explain so that you become a better English speaker and enrich your vocabulary. As I read the book, you can follow along on the screen. As I read, I will highlight certain words or phrases. When I have finished the reading, I will come back and review each of those words and phrases. The word and phrase review will improve both your reading comprehension as well as give you new words to add to your vocabulary. In order for you to track your progress in reading comprehension and new vocabulary, I have set a test. The link to the test appears below this video on YouTube. Access to the test is free, but if you wish to receive a mark, a score, for the test, you will need to be a member of my Patreon group. Details for my Patreon group are found both inside the video as well as underneath the video on YouTube. The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway Book 1 Chapter 3 It was a warm spring night and I sat at a table on the terrace of the Napolitaine after Robert had gone watching it get dark and the electric signs come on and the red and green stop and go traffic signal and the crowd going by and the horse cabs clippity clopping along at the edge of the solid taxi traffic and the puels going by singly and in pairs looking for the evening meal. I watched a good looking girl walk past the table and watched her go up the street and lost sight of her, and watched another, and then saw the first one coming back again. She went by once more, and I caught her eye, and she came over and sat down at the table. The waiter came up. Well, what will you drink? I asked. Pernod. That's not good for little girls. Little girl yourself. Dites garçon, un pernod. A pernod for me too. What's the matter? she asked. Going on a party? Sure. Aren't you? I don't know. You never know in this town. Don't you like Paris? No. Why don't you go somewhere else? Isn't anywhere else. You're happy, all right. Happy hell. Pernod is a greenish imitation absinthe. When you add water, it turns milky. It tastes like licorice. And it has a good uplift, but it drops you just as far. We sat and drank it, and the girl looked sullen. Well, I said, are you going to buy me dinner? She grinned, and I saw why she made a point of not laughing. With her mouth closed, she was a rather pretty girl. I paid for the sauces, and we walked out to the street. I hailed a horse cab, and the driver pulled up at the curb. Settled back in the slow, smoothly rolling fiacre, we moved up the Avenue de l'Opera, past the locked doors of the shops, their windows lighted, the avenue broad and shiny and almost deserted. The cab passed the New York Herald Bureau with the window full of clocks. What are all the clocks for? she asked. They show the hour all over America. Don't kid me. We turned off the avenue up the Rue des Pyramides, through the traffic of the Rue de Rivoli, and through a dark gate into the Tuileries. She cuddled against me and I put my arm around her. She looked up to be kissed. She touched me with one hand and I put her hand away. Never mind. What's the matter? You sick? Yes. Everybody's sick. I'm sick too. We came out of the Tuileries into the light and crossed the Seine and then turned up the Rue de saint Pérez. You oughtn't to drink Pernod if you're sick. You neither. It doesn't make any difference with me. It doesn't make any difference with a woman. What are you called? Georgette. How are you called? Jacob. That's a Flemish name. American too. You're not Flamand? No, American. Good. I detest flamens. By this time, we were at the restaurant. I called to the co-chair to stop. We got out 
and Georgette did not like the looks of the place. This is no great thing of a restaurant. No, I said. Maybe you would rather go to Foyot's. Why don't you keep the cab and go on? I had picked her up because of a vague sentimental idea that it would be nice to eat with someone. It was a long time since I had dined with a poor, and I had forgotten how dull it could be. We went into the restaurant, past Madame Levine at the desk and into a little room. Georgette cheered up a little under the food. It isn't bad here, she said. It isn't chic, but the food is all right. Better than you eat in Liège? Brussels, you mean. We had another bottle of wine and Georgette made a joke. She smiled and showed all her bad teeth and we touched glasses. You're not a bad type, she said. It's a shame you're sick. We get on well. What's the matter with you anyway? I got hurt in the war, I said. Oh, that dirty war. We would probably have gone on and discussed the war and agreed that it was in reality a calamity for civilization and perhaps would have been better avoided. I was bored enough. Just then, from the other room, someone called Barnes. I say, Barnes, Jacob Barnes. It's a friend calling me, I explained, and went out. There was Braddock's at a big table with a party. Cone, Francis Klein, Mrs. Braddock's, several people I did not know. You're coming to the dance, aren't you? Braddock's asked. What dance? Why, the dancings. Don't you know, we've revived them, Mrs. Braddock's put in. You must come, Jake, we're all going, Francis said from the end of the table. She was tall and had a smile. Of course he's coming, Braddock said. Come in and have coffee with us, Barnes. Right. And bring your friend, said Mrs. Braddock's, laughing. She was a Canadian and had all their easy social graces. Thanks. We'll be in, I said. I went back to the small room. Who are your friends? Georgette asked. Writers and artists. There are lots of those on this side of the river. Too many. I think so. Still, some of them make money. Oh, yes. We finished the meal and the wine. Come on, I said. We're going to have coffee with the others. Georgette opened her bag, made a few passes at her face as she looked in the little mirror, redefined her lips with the lipstick, and straightened her hat. Good, she said. We went into the room full of people, and Braddock's and the men at his table stood up. I wish to present my fiancée, Mademoiselle Georgette Leblanc, I said. Georgette smiled that wonderful smile, and we shook hands all round. Are you related to Georgette Leblanc, the singer? Mrs. Braddocks asked. Connais pas, Georgette answered. But you have the same name, Mrs. Braddocks insisted cordially. No, said Georgette, not at all. My name is Hobin. But Mr. Barnes introduced you as Mademoiselle Georgette Leblanc. Surely he did, insisted Mrs. Braddocks who in the excitement of talking French was liable to have no idea what she was saying. He's a fool, Georgette said. Oh, it was a joke then, Mrs. Braddock said. Yes, said Georgette, to laugh at. Did you hear that, Henry? Mrs. Braddock called down the table to Braddock. Mr. Barnes introduced his fiancée as Mademoiselle Leblanc, and her name is actually Hoban. Of course, darling, Mademoiselle Hoban. I've known her for a very long time. Oh, Mademoiselle Hoban, Francis Klein called, speaking French very rapidly and not seeming so proud and astonished as Mrs. Braddock's at its coming out really French. Have you been in Paris long? Do you like it here? You love Paris, do you not? Who's she? Georgette turned to me. Do I have to talk to her? She turned to Francis, sitting smiling, her hands folded, her head poised on her long neck, her lips pursed, ready to start talking again. No, I don't like Paris. It's expensive and dirty. Really? I find it so extraordinarily clean, 
one of the cleanest cities in all Europe. I find it dirty. How strange! But perhaps you have not been here very long. I've been here long enough. But it does have nice people in it. One must grant that. Georgette turned to me. You have nice friends. Francis was a little drunk and would have liked to have kept it up. But the coffee came and Levine with the liqueurs. And after that we all went out and started for Braddock's Dancing Club. The Dancing Club was a bal musette in the Rue de la Montaigne, Saint Genevieve. Five nights a week the working people of the Pantheon Quarter danced there. One night a week it was the Dancing Club. On Monday nights it was closed. When we arrived it was quite empty, except for a policeman sitting near the door, the wife of the proprietor, back of the zinc bar, and the proprietor himself. The daughter of the house came downstairs as we went in. There were long benches and tables ran across the room and at the far end a dancing floor. I wish people would come earlier, Braddock said. The daughter came up and wanted to know what we would drink. The proprietor got up on a high stool beside the dancing floor and began to play the accordion. He had a string of bells around one of his ankles and beat time with his foot as he played. Everyone danced. It was hot and we came off the floor perspiring. My God, Georgette said, what a box to sweat in. It's hot. Hot, my God. Take off your hat. That's a good idea. Someone asked Georgette to dance and I went over to the bar. It was really very hot and the accordion music was pleasant in the hot night. I drank a beer, standing in the doorway and getting the cool breath of wind from the street. Two taxis were coming down the steep street. They both stopped in front of the bowl. A group of young men, some in jerseys and some in their shirt sleeves, got out. I could see their hands and newly washed wavy hair in the light from the door. The policeman standing by the door looked at me and smiled. They came in. As they went in under the light I saw white hands, wavy hair, white faces, grimacing, gesturing, talking. With them was Brett. She looked very lovely and she was very much with them. One of them saw Georgette and said, I do declare there is an actual harlot. I'm going to dance with her, Let. You watch me. The tall dark one called Let said, Don't you be rash. The wavy blonde one answered, Don't you worry, dear. And with them was Brett. I was very angry. Somehow they always made me angry. I know they are supposed to be amusing and you should be tolerant, but I wanted to swing on one, anyone, anything to shatter that superior simpering composure. Instead, I walked down the street and had a beer at the bar at the next bal. The beer was not good, and I had a worse cognac to take the taste out of my mouth. When I came back to the bal, there was a crowd on the floor, and Georgette was dancing with the tall blonde youth, who danced big hippily, carrying his head on one side. His eyes lifted as he danced. As soon as the music stopped, another one of them asked her to dance. She had been taken up by them. I knew then that they would all dance with her. They like that. I sat down at a table. Cone was sitting there. Francis was dancing. Mrs. Braddocks brought up somebody and introduced him as Robert Prentice. He was from New York, by way of Chicago, and was a rising new novelist. He had some sort of an English accent. I asked him to have a drink. Thanks so much, he said. I've just had one. Have another. Thanks, I will then. We got the daughter of the house over and each had a finna Lou. You're from Kansas City, they tell me, he said. Yes. Do you find Paris amusing? Yes. Really? I was a little drunk. Not drunk in any positive sense, but just enough to be careless. For God's sake, I said. Yes, don't you? Oh, how charmingly you get angry, he said. I wish I had that faculty. I got up and walked over toward the dancing floor. Mrs. Braddocks followed me. Don't be cross with Robert, she said. He's still only a child, you know. I wasn't cross, I said. I just thought perhaps I was going to throw up.
Your fiancé is having a great success. Mrs. Braddock looked out on the dance floor where Georgette was dancing in the arms of the tall dark one called Let. Isn't she? I said. Rather, said Mrs. Braddock. Cone came up. Come on, Jake, he said. Have a drink. We walked over to the bar. What's the matter with you? You seem all worked up over something. Nothing. This whole show makes me sick is all. Brett came up to the bar. Hello, you chaps. Hello, Brett, I said. Why aren't you tight? Never going to get tight any more. I say, give a chap a brandy and soda. She stood holding the glass and I saw Robert Cohn looking at her. He looked a great deal, as his compatriot must have looked when he saw the promised land. Cohn, of course, was much younger, but he had that look of eager, deserving expectation. Brett was damn good looking. She wore a slip-over jersey sweater and a tweed skirt, and her hair was brushed back like a boy's. She started all that. She was built with curves like the hull of a racing yacht, and you missed none of it with that wool jersey. It's a fine crowd you're with, Brett, I said. Aren't they lovely? And you, my dear, where did you get it? At the Napolitaine. And have you had a lovely evening? Oh, priceless, I said. Brett laughed. It's wrong of you, Jake. It's an insult to all of us. Look at Francis there and Joe. This for Cone's benefit. It's in restraint of trade, Brett said. She laughed again. You're wonderfully sober, I said. Yes, aren't I? And when one's with the crowd I'm with, one can drink in such safety, too. The music started, and Robert Cohn said, Will you dance this with me, Lady Brett? Brett smiled at him. I've promised to dance this with Jacob, she laughed. You've a hell of a biblical name, Jake. How about the next, asked Cohn. We're going, Brett said. We've a date up at Montmartre. Dancing, I looked over Brett's shoulder and saw Cone standing at the bar still watching her. You've made a new one there, I said to her. Don't talk about it, poor chap. I never knew it till just now. Oh well, I said, I suppose you like to add them up. Don't talk like a fool. You do. Oh well, what if I do? Nothing, I said. We were dancing to the accordion and someone was playing the banjo. It was hot and I felt happy. We passed close to Georgette dancing with another one of them. What possessed you to bring her? I don't know why I just brought her. You're getting damned romantic. No, bored. Now? No, not now. Let's get out of here. She's well taken care of. Do you want to? Would I ask you if I didn't want to? We left the floor and I took my coat off a hanger on the wall and put it on. Brett stood by the bar. Cone was talking to her. I stopped at the bar and asked them for an envelope. The patron found one. I took a 50-franc note from my pocket, put it in the envelope, sealed it, and handed it to the patron. If the girl I came with asks for me, will you give her this, I said? If she goes out with one of those gentlemen, will you save this for me? C'est entendu, monsieur. The patron said, You go now? So early? Yes, I said. We started out the door. Cone was still talking to Brett. She said good night and took my arm. Good night, Cone, I said. Outside in the street we looked for a taxi. You're going to lose your fifty francs, Brett said. Oh, yes. No taxis. We could walk up to the Pantheon and get one. Come on and we'll get a drink in the pub next door and send for one. You wouldn't walk across the street? Not if I could help it. We went into the next bar and I sent a waiter for a taxi. Well, I said, we're out away from them. We stood against the tall zinc bar and did not talk and looked at each other. The waiter came and said the taxi was outside. Brett pressed my hand hard. I gave the waiter a franc and we went out. Where should I tell him? I asked. Oh, tell him to drive around. I told the driver to go to the Parc Montsouris and got in and slammed the door. Brett was leaning back in the corner, her eyes closed. I got in and sat beside her. The cab started with a jerk. Oh, darling, I've been so miserable, Brett said. Let's start our closer look at Chapter 3. Clippity, 
clopping. Clippity clopping is an example of a technique in English which is called onomatopoeia. It is a complicated word which describes something very simple. Onomatopoeia is the technique and it appears in most languages where a word is a creation which reflects the sound of something. So in this case the horse cabs clippity clopping. This means the sound of the horse's hooves on the road. You could say it is like clippity clop, clippity clop, clippity clop. So this is a verbal representation of the sound of the horse's hooves. You will notice how long the first sentence of chapter 3 is. It is made up of many clauses separated by commas. You may wonder why he did not break this long sentence into a number of shorter sentences. But he did this deliberately. He wanted to convey the sense of a rhythmic flow of people and the machines and it is slightly hypnotic and it is very deliberate this technique and appears in other parts of the book as well. Words which are in italics in this book are French words. I will not be explaining the French words as you can look those up in a dictionary but poulet this particular word has got some significance to the story because it means young women usually, a young woman or young women, and it has a possibly negative connotation, meaning that the young woman is promiscuous. Looking for the evening meal. What this means is not a literal meaning. It does not mean that they were looking physically for the meal on a table. What it means is that they were looking for somebody at one of the tables who would be prepared to buy them dinner. And so they were attempting to attract somebody's attention at one of the tables and hopefully thereby be offered a free meal. I caught her eye. This means that when she looked at him or past him, he looked intently at her and held her gaze. He held her look. So what he was doing was staring at her and sending a message, a signal that he was interested. Greenish. Greenish is a variation on the word green. And ish is placed after many words in English to indicate a degree of or an amount of, not necessarily a lot of. It means it has some of the quantity or the quality of this subject. So we could say something is reddish or something is it's easyish it's an easyish test these are ways in which you can express degree in english not too much but a little bit absinthe absinthe is an alcoholic drink licorice licorice is the aromatic substance which comes from a plant root and is often used in candy or as some people would call them sweets and it is used as a flavorant. Uplift. Uplift means that it makes you feel good. It gives you a slang expression would be a buzz or makes you feel like on a small feeling of being high you could say. When someone is sullen, it means that they are in a bad mood and will not smile for any reason. No matter what you say or do, they refuse to be visibly happy. When you hail a cab, 
This term is still used today. It means you called or you got the attention of the horse cab driver. You could still, on the street, hail a cab today by shouting or by waving. Hail can also mean, in English, recognize somebody for a great achievement. We could say a person was hailed in society as one of the great chess players of our time. Or a person was hailed as a great astronaut, one of the greatest. They were recognized. They were acknowledged. They showed the hour. It means that the clocks in the window showed the different times of different cities in America. So one clock might have showed the time in New York and another clock might have showed the time in Los Angeles. Don't kid me. This is an American slang expression which means don't joke with me. Don't fool around with me. Don't make fun of me. When people cuddle in English, it means that they physically hug and embrace each other. It implies mild physical intimacy. When you detest somebody, it means that you hate them. Georgette did not like the looks of. The looks of, it means the appearance of, the way that the place looked to her, how it appeared. I had picked her up. Picked her up is an expression used in English when, in this case, he picked her up, but a woman can also pick a man up. And it means that you made a move on them to take them out on a date or to spend time with them in a romantic sense. Chic is used in English today, but it has its base in French. And it means stylish or fashionable. A calamity is an awful event, a disastrous event, but even more serious than a disaster. It implies almost total destruction, something that is totally bad. So when he describes the war, he is viewing the war as having been completely destructive for civilization. Mrs. Braddocks says that they have revived the dancings. It means that at some point in time in the past, they had dances and then they were cancelled or postponed or they stopped happening for some reason. When they say they've revived them, it means that they are now putting them on again. Reviving means bringing something back. If you say someone was revived after nearly drowning, it means that they were saved after nearly drowning. Easy social graces. This means that Mrs. Braddocks was very comfortable, was very confident amongst other people. It means that she had no problems interacting with other people. She was very relaxed. She wasn't tense when she dealt with other people. And he says that she was a Canadian and had all their easy graces. It means that he is assigning this trait to Canadians, that they are very easy people to get on with. They are People who find dealing with other people very easy. Cordially means that Mrs. Braddocks was insistent. It means she wanted an answer, but she did it politely. She did it in a non-hostile, a non-threatening way. So she asked politely. Liable. What this means is that because Mrs. Braddocks got excited when talking French there was a strong chance that she had no idea what she was saying. It is possible that she had no idea what she was saying. Liable has a number of meanings in English. 
Another use of the word liable is to indicate responsibility. For example, if your dog bit somebody, one could say that you would be liable for the injury to that person because it is your dog. Or in a car accident, people are going to fight about who is liable, who was at fault, who caused the accident. The use of the word poised here is both a reference to her physical appearance, which implies gracefulness, but at the same time, it also implies something about her character because the word poised means ready. So we can say someone is poised to attack. They are ready to attack. And as we see, Francis is quite a snooty, aggressive, mean person. And so this is also a literary technique used by the author to draw attention to her character, which is aggressive and prone to attack other people. Her lips were pursed is when somebody presses their lips together. It normally indicates irritation or not being happy, frustration with something or someone. One must grant that. It means you must agree that or you must acknowledge that or you must concede that. So you agree with the person who is making the point to you. To keep it up, this means continue. So Francis was a little drunk and she was attacking Georgette and it was amusing her and she would have liked to have continued, kept it up, continued, but the coffee came and that interrupted her. The wife of the proprietor was back of the zinc bar. This is another way to say she was behind or on the other side of the zinc bar. The proprietor beat time with his foot. This means that he tapped his foot on the floor in time with the music, the beat of the music. So if you're listening to a concert and you tap your fingers in unison or in harmony with the beat, this is called beating time. When somebody grimaces, it means they pull their face into an expression that is not very pleasant. So, for example, if you were to eat a lemon and then pull your face into an expression and say, oh, I don't like this, or you will see children who, when eating something, a taste they don't like, they will often grimace very visibly to show that they do not like what they are eating. So a grimace is an unpleasant expression. There is an actual harlot. A harlot is a prostitute. So he assumed that Georgette was a prostitute. Don't you be rash. Rash in this meaning of the word, this context, means to act or behave irresponsibly, to do something without thinking. Mrs. Braddock's brought up somebody. This means that she physically led this person forward in order to introduce him to Jake. He was from New York by way of Chicago. This means that even though he was from New York or said he was from New York, he had previously been in Chicago. We don't know if he was born in Chicago or if Chicago had been the previous place that he had lived in. But Jake is telling us that he is not a New Yorker and that he has a past, at least in Chicago. That faculty, a faculty is a personal trait. It can be either a positive thing or a negative thing. So Prentice is being sarcastic when he says, how charmingly you get angry, 
I wish I had that faculty. I wish I had that ability. Don't be cross. Cross is a word which means angry with or irritated with. I was going to throw up. Throw up means to be sick, to physically be sick. You seem all worked up over something. Worked up means to be out of sorts, to be upset about something. Hello, Brett. I said, why aren't you tight? Tight means to be drunk, to be under the influence of alcohol. Jake's use of the word priceless here is the exact opposite of its literal meaning. Priceless literally means something so valuable that you cannot put a monetary financial value on it. But in this case, his sarcastic use of the word means the exact opposite and that his evening has had no worth at all. For Cohen's benefit, this means that her words were intended to be listened to by Cohn. They were aimed at Cohn. It's in restraint of trade. This is a rather difficult expression to explain in this context. But my interpretation of this is that normally restraint of trade means that you stop somebody from being able to go about their normal business. My own interpretation of this comment by Brett is that Jake bringing Georgette was actually preventing Brett from spending time with Jake. You've made a new one there. Jake is saying to Brett that she has acquired or gained a new admirer in the form of Cohn. When Jake says, I suppose you like to add them up, what he means is that Brett likes to acquire admirers. She likes to flirt with men so that they become admirers of her. It is a jealous statement by Jake and which is why she replies, don't talk like a fool. And he continues by accusing her, saying, you do. She's well taken care of. This means that Jake is saying that people will spend time with, want to be in the company of Georgette. He doesn't need to stay and look after her or take care of her. So Brett's friends are going to look after her. She is not his responsibility because she has enough people around her to look after her. Not if I could help it is sometimes also said as not if I can help it. And the intonation would be not if I can help it, not if I could help it. And it indicates that you do not want to do something. You will only do something if it is absolutely necessary or if you are forced to do it. So it is usually in reply to a suggestion or a question from somebody about an action which you might take but which you don't want to do. An example might be if someone asked me, do you want to go on a beach holiday next year and if I really didn't like going to the beach I might reply not if I can help it I hate the beach that brings us to the end of today's book reading and the lesson with it please like and subscribe in order to get notifications about future episodes and other postings on this channel also, don't forget to do the test in order to track your progress in reading comprehension improvement and vocabulary expansion. Thank you for joining me today and I look forward to you joining me in the future.